Hello and welcome everybody to the October 5th Legislative Committee meeting. So I'll start with, uh, I'm looking for a, a motion to adopt the agenda. Councillor Brodjak, is there any additions or deletions? We may be d deleting our first uh, delegation. It's not here yet, but we'll give them a little bit of time and we'll try to fill in with something else when we start. So anybody else? No. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you. Next up is adoption of the minutes of our last legislative meeting. I'll be looking. Councillor Lemko makes the motion. Any errors or omissions this time? Nothing this time? Okay. All those in favor? Carried. So uh, for right now, we're going to go to Community Services. Uh, Director Phil Rowe. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, read a letter from the uh, FCSS team to uh, uh, basically council and all staff. It's an announcement of retirement. It is with mixed emotions that we announce the retirement of Lisa Topilko, community programmer, seniors and adults with the Town of Egerville FCSS Department. Lisa has been an outstanding employee who has dedicated 17 years. Sadly, her last day will be October 7th, 2021. It's difficult to sum up Lisa's achievements, <clears throat> but as we reflect, we are quick to recognize that she has taken assisting the residents of Egerville and the County of Minburn to a whole new level. During a pandemic, the need to help older adults and those who are most vulnerable has been greater than ever and Lisa's ability to navigate situations and keep them moving in a positive direction has been unparalleled. Over the years, another especially admired quality has been Lisa's remarkable ability to adapt to change, learn new things, all while remaining dedicated to her work. It's Lisa's love for her community and her commitment to its growth and vitality that have made her an integral member of our FCSS team. We are especially going to miss the positive energy and the contagious laughter she brought to the office. Thank you for everything you have done over the years, Lisa. Your work has improved the lives of many others. And so on behalf of my <coughs> FCSS team, I would uh, like to wish uh, Lisa Topoko a very happy retirement and sad to see her leave. Okay, would anybody like to make a comment on Lisa's retirement? Councillor Barry, you can start. Thank you, Your Worship. Yes, uh, Lisa's going to be definitely missed. I've uh, had the opportunity to work with her several times, and uh, she certainly does know the community, and the community always relied on getting a hold of her to get a lot of information. Uh, she was a really good programmer, and uh, she will be missed. So um, happy retirement. Okay, Councillor Warwell. <coughs> I just wanted to say, very similar to Councillor Barry, um, I had the pleasure of working with Lisa several times, um, sitting on the FCSS board. She's uh, just a very caring, very professional uh, lady and um, was a great addition to the team. So I just wanted to add that and wish her a happy retirement. Thank you. Well, Councillor Lemka. Yes, uh, I would like to uh, wish uh, Lisa a very happy retirement. Lisa's one of those employees that uh, didn't watch the clock from morning till night. She'd often be dropping off uh, tax forms after hours, picking them up after hours to the volunteers that were doing income tax and all the other uh, places she was after hours and just giving with her heart on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, she'll be sorely missed. Uh, Lisa, good luck in retirement and uh, have fun farming with your grandkids. <laughs> well, on behalf of the did you want to say something? We'll go right there. Yeah, I was just going to say as well, uh, congratulations on her retirement. Uh, well earned. Uh, definitely a hole will be left there. Uh, she was very vibrant and always accessible. She was quick to jump to the pump kind of thing and uh, get things done. So congratulations to Lisa. Okay. Go ahead. I would be remiss if I didn't thank Lisa for her work as a tireless volunteer, a community leader. Uh, and a trusted town employee. But she was also a teacher for many of us too. So there are many of us in this community that benefited from her influence. And uh, I think the town has been well served by somebody who is devoted to her community and devoted to the people that belong to this community, especially the most vulnerable, seniors and those that required additional support and assistance. So I think we were well served. And Lisa was also acknowledged by the FCSS 
A, um, the Provincial Association uh, for her work and she's done Vagerville proud and I wish her well in her next adventures with her grandkids. Councilor Roger. I'd also like to thank uh, Lisa and wish her well on her retirement. Uh, Lisa was uh, with the Community Volunteer Income, Income Tax Program since its inception and I believe that was at around 2010 or 11. Uh, she's helped several uh, needy uh, seniors that required this service to help them uh, keep re receiving their benefits. So Lisa, thank you so much for your outstanding service and you will be missed. Thank you. Okay, well, I'd just like to uh, thank Lisa on behalf of the residents of the town of Eggerville. She's been a very positive influence in a lot of people's lives, and I know that she'll be missed within this organization, and, uh, and uh, I'm sure that we'll see her smiling face around town. So thank you very much, Lisa. Okay, next up we're going to have Bob. Are you ready, Bob? Yeah. Bob Pispelko, Economic Development Update. You got your clicker? Yeah. It's all yours, my friend. Uh, thank you. As this is my first uh, indirect presentation to uh, the council, it's kind of strange. I used to do delegations and presentations all the time, and now to see you folks right in front of me <laughs> live, it's, uh, it's kind of freaky. Uh, yeah, I took the liberty, as this is my first direct presentation or report to council, uh, last six months, of course, I've been working hand in hand with Cliff Craig. Uh, and uh, saying that. So I put together a PowerPoint presentation and I've incorporated not only my activities for the most part, but also a strategy, how I approach this, because I never had a chance to speak to uh, the council in regards uh, to how I approach economic development. As uh, most of you know, I've been in this section of life and economic development for close to 20 years. I eat, live, breathe economic development and of course, growing up in this neck of the woods and going to school in Derwent, that doesn't exist anymore. I wish they uh, knew what economic development was way back then. Uh, so to start out, the first slide, uh, basically the guiding principle, of course, is the mission statement and the vision statement of Vegreville and innovation and embracing change are the two areas that really jumped uh, out at me because, as we all know, that's the world we live in today. And if my clicker works, hot dog. Economic development, my definition, and uh, there's a few definitions. It, first of all, it is a process, and it is a long-term game. And I've got it down to creating wealth in our community. And, of course, that can be interpreted by a young family moving in to that billion-dollar smokestack to each his own. Thus, in return, of course, it provides a better quality of life for our residents. And that is the name of the game. Okay, my clicker doesn't want to work. Jameson? <laughs> Can you advance the slide? Thanks. Uh, most of you know my background is advertising promotions. I've spent uh, years in radio uh, and marketing, and that's what economic development is, marketing. And of course, there's a difference between selling and marketing. Selling is pushing the product in a very... Uh, respectful way to a customer, but marketing is addressing the needs. And that's where the fo uh, focus is. Product development, and then there's product promotion. Product development, of course, is the town of Beggarville. Uh, and there. And the item I, like, I threw in, marketing is like asking someone on a date, and branding is the reason they say yes. So uh, that's how I relate to it. No, it's all yours, Jameson. You got to go to the next one. My approach, uh, research-based, strategy-led, collaborative, proactive. And of course, research-based, great reports that were done recently by MDB, proactive, going out and telling our story. And economic development isn't a separate department. It's woven through the fabric of the organization. And uh, Vegreville is a great example to that. And further on into my presentation, I will speak to it. Next slide, please. The strategic goals, the first one for me is enabling investment. There's a term we're all used to, business retention, expansion. I can call it enabling investment because whether the information we gather and in our story we tell out, whether it's for a person in the United Kingdom 
or in Vegreville, the information is the same. It all comes down to that. Business support, entrepreneurship, and of course, community capacity building, uh, as well as the town, also the regional. One goes with the other. And of course, marketing is throughout all three of those uh, strategic goals. Next one, please. Enabling investment activities, last six months, a lot of information gathering. Reviewing reports, current marketing material, website profiles, trends in agriculture, technology, and industry. Trying to match the two. So I spent a lot of time research. I'm an information junkie. Uh, I really follow what's happening there. Also the inventory of assets in the town of Vegreville, and that's land, buildings, office space, whatever we have that can drive economic development. Of course, industry sectors. What drives the economy of Vegreville? Uh, I ask the question of all the money that comes into this town, where does it come from? What's driving it? And having an understanding and then of course leveraging from it. Uh, the Vegreville Economic Development uh, Advisory Board has been instrumental. It represents a cross-section of, uh, of, uh, of our economy, our town. However, I do consider all of Vegreville to be my, board, uh, my advisory board. You know, uh, more information. Every town department, uh, I'd like to thank Dale and his team of planning and development, his team of Kristen, uh, Karina and Brianne have been phenomenal of sharing information. Planning and development and economic development go hand in hand. Uh, the other departments, finance, I wanna thank Paul. Uh, again, understanding uh, the sustainability of a uh, community. You know, I needed him to confirm numbers for me. Uh, for example, for every dollar we bring in from residential tax, we spend about a buck 65 to service it. Commercial, industrial, not so much, 65, 70 cents. So Paul has uh, been kind enough to share a lot of information and sustainability. Uh, the community, Phil's department, community services, working with uh, uh, Julie and Anya have been incredible because the two departments, again, economic development, there's a social side as well as the for money, make profit, and the two work hand in hand. Uh, also, Christina, uh, up in uh, the utility payments, a uh, young lady walked in the other day, I overheard the conversation, moving to town, and they want to hook up utilities. So I asked Christina to monitor over a monthly basis how many of those actually happen. And through her great way of customer service, talking with uh, these people why they came to our community. That's incredible uh, information to know. Uh, again, every member of the staff, on a side note, it made me feel really welcome. Uh, in there, they put up with my jocularity, if I may put it that way. Uh, also, Inotech, everybody knows the story there, have been uh, an incredible source. Jan Slatsky, uh, John Ezekiel, and even the um, Chief Financial Officer, Steve McMahon, built a great relationship with them. That is a, one of our strongest value propositions going. And of course, our airport is an underused uh, a facility. Uh, that we're hoping to make a lot busier. Next slide, please. Uh, again, the meetings I've had with business uh, have met with ATCO, uh, Draw Free Mayor, I believe his name is, uh, our regional manager I've met, and just recently I met with the Vice President of Energy Solutions regarding the future fuel activity that's happening uh, north of town. RJV, I uh, had a great discussion with uh, Mike Wood, Co-op, the new owners of Egg Suites, the hotels, uh, the one partner is in uh, London, Ontario, the other one in Vancouver, I believe, and uh, they own hotels across the country, but under different flags. They're not, I uh, think. Of course, the mayor and myself have had a discussion with Hotello, uh, keeping it uh, as a hotel, uh, so hopefully that moves forward. Uh, Globera, Quest, uh, Bueller, right now I'm involved working with Bueller. There is a local investment group that's trying to keep activity and bringing back the Easy On brand here. So keep your fingers crossed, folks. Uh, hopefully that comes through. Great discussion of webs, TELUS, 5G coming our way, uh, uh, hopefully by 2024, and that opens up the autonomous vehicle training or testing. So real innovation uh, possibilities. Uh, 
on that. Uh, met with Wild and Company, ATB, Vigorable Ford, Vantage Builders. Uh, this morning I had discussions with Boston Pita, Scott, uh, as well as met Tammy at Unwind's uh, Bar and Grill. So again, I keep talking with local businesses and to understand uh, where uh, their needs, barriers, and opportunities rely. Next one, please, Jameson. Real estate. These folks are vitally important. Uh, I'd like to thank Councillor Waters. I've met with her and her team uh, to get an, a good understanding of what's happening. Century 21, Gus and Gary, uh, as well, they're critical. Uh, real estate people have their finger on the pulse of our community. I've also met and discussed with Avis and Young, uh, NAI Commercial, of course, they have the Blue Sky uh, property, Cushman Wakefield, and Remax Edmonton, they have the CPC building. Uh, kind of frightened these guys because they thought I was going to try and sell the building under them, and I told them, that's not my role. <laughs> However, you're just trying to sell a building. Do you have the story of Eggerville? The why? If it's an agricultural client that you're dealing with, do you know that within a 150-kilometer radius, Eggerville has access to over 6 million cultivated acres for a feedstock, whether it's hemp, flax, protein, all of it. So these guys were very appreciative. Uh, I know a couple of the guys from Cushman Wakefield we met for a meeting here because we're thinking of ideas for the ATCO building, for all of it, really thinking outside the box. Uh, that The downside, uh, we need to know the good, the back and the bad and the reality. Uh, the markets of Vegreville and St. Paul are weak. He, they have properties in Kitscotty, manufacturing and stuff. But again, understanding reality, let's start thinking outside the box and looking for uh, the solutions uh, there. Next one. Business support and entrepreneurship, of course, this is the mandate of the Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce is a critical part of, uh, of economic development, and the information that I send out, I send to Michelle. She uh, gets it out to her membership. However, there are businesses here that aren't member, uh, Chamber members, and I'm building up a database so they're aware of grants, funding, information industry uh, trends, uh, major project opportunities. The fuel uh, futures, talking with Andrew, what opportunity does that open up for local businesses to get a piece of the action? The Grizzly Bear Creek windmill, uh, wind turbine project south of Manville, 36 uh, turbines going up at 120, meter, 120 meters each. Those are some tall turbines. What opportunities are there for our local uh, businesses? So again, information is critical, but it needs to get out to uh, there. Of course, identifying the barriers, needless to say, as the, chain, uh, as the council is very aware of operating costs for businesses today, uh, taxes, and yeah, labor needs. There is a shortage out there. Scott and Tammy this morning again emphasized the need for uh, getting people here. And of course, I'm a believer that Business and industry, even though the trends are changing, we work from home, remote workers, but jobs are the number one reason people move to a community. At the same time, their partner is also a labor supply that they bring along with their kids. So the focus, but keeping in mind uh, what is going on. Next one, please. The third, community capacity, a prepared community site selection criteria. And again, this information applies not only for attraction, but retention. Uh, spoke to a few companies in our town that might be looking at expanding. So what is available? The top two regarding workforce, availability of skilled labor and labor costs. That is what every uh, company leads out with. Accessibility, proximity to global markets, and I did put a slash for customers. Again, the customers for retail and areas like that. But companies today are looking to set up that give me easy access to uh, the global markets because, ladies and gentlemen, we are in a global economy. The widget I produce must get out to the global market. Transportation, highways, air, international, uh, rail uh, is critical, supply chain, uh, and of course availability of sites and buildings, Prosperity Industrial Park, 75th Street uh, Business Park is, is, is critical. Next slide. Affordability, low cost again, business environment, taxes, fees, utilities, education, workforce partnerships, training and funding. I have been in discussions with uh, the president of Lakeland College, Alice uh, Stewart Wainwright, 
and we are looking of establishing, hopefully, some type of post-secondary education in, in Vegreville. Uh, we, do our, we are focused on more of the AI, machine learning, the technology today, and tie that in. Uh, relative incentives, yeah, uh, most people jump to tax breaks. However, the price that Vegreville offers for a great piece of land at an acre here in Industrial Park and 75th Street, that's an incentive. So it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, void my taxes for the next year. Quality of life, again, education, healthcare, recreation is critical. That goes hand in hand. Customer service, uh, I coined this phrase from the former president of uh, Edmonton Economic Development. Bob, what is it you do? We provide information in a user-friendly way. They want it current, they want it accurate, and they want it now. So that's what we are uh, focused on. Next slide. Marketing. Profile development. Uh, before I leave today, Hopefully not for good. I, well, I have a marketing uh, investment folder I'll pass to each council member to review. That includes why Vegreville for investment, quality of life, and industrial hemp uh, profile, and our airport. Still on the way is uh, marketing profiles for 75th Street and uh, the industrial park. Website content, and by the way, that gentleman sitting over there, Jameson, we work hand in hand, communications and marketing. I didn't highlight it, but I take that as a given. Uh, Jameson and I, uh, both having similar backgrounds, and Cliff can never get a word in edgewise, uh, you know, really works out. Uh, virtual videos, uh, I finally completed one that we'll be, uh, I'll be showing the council. The social media campaign that uh, the advisory board put together with uh, Lono and Zag, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, wraps up October 15th. I would say it was a decent campaign. Uh, we learned some lessons as opposed to using authentic pictures, which lesson learned, and I, that's on me, uh, that. So th that was pretty good. Uh, however, word of mouth, residents positively promoting our community, nothing beats that form of marketing. I can put all the videos together and all the glossy brochures, but people speaking positively about our community. I heard an interesting stat the other day that if you can get 20% of your, po of your population speaking positively, that's a game changer. And uh, I'd like to think most of the people talk very positively about Vegreville, that's what I've heard. Again, it's telling our story and our why. Next one. Again, focus very strongly on Prosperity Industrial Park, 75th Street Business Park, our sign worked. I got a call from a gentleman the other day that's interested in one acre of land. We're coming in at about 1.5 acres is our, uh, our, our smallest uh, lot size, but I sent him the information and he is uh, considering it. Uh, the agricultural sectors, my focus again, working with InnoTech, hemp companies. In fact, 10 minutes before I just walked into this presentation, I received another lead opportunity from a company, or there's, they're landing in Canada. Uh, it is hemp-based and it's a Russian, uh, French, uh, conglomerate that's looking at that. I do need to let the council know that there are a few conversations I have with business and it starts out, Bob, you need to keep this confidential. Now, having said that, I know I also represent Vegreville. So, Mr. Cliff Craig and I have some very confidential conversations because it does come down if uh, I do need help getting my butt out of the fire. Cliff is aware of it, so thanks, Cliff, uh, on that. Uh, again, plan protein. I referred to their food is the new world. And again, it was highlighted in the MDB report, Vegreville can go with value added food processing. We really have some uh, uh, strengths in that area. So that's another area to focus on. Uh, cannabis microcultivation. I am working with a gentleman right now that's looking at setting up a micro cultivation in the 75th Street Business Park. Uh, so there is activity there. Professional technology research, a UAVs. Uh, when I came to Vegreville, I also brought along a lot of leads with drone companies. As soon as we did the profile on the airport, we are UAV friendly after checking with Dale and his team. Uh, one guy phones me up and says, Bob, tomorrow we're coming out to take a look. Uh, they're very interested in doing research, crime prevention, convention using drones. And then he says, Bob, if you want more drone activity here, you need a skill set. How would you like to get involved in drone soccer? Get the kids in that. Basically, the bottom line, get kids between the ages of 12 and 18. They actually build the drone, code it. They're in a mesh like a batting cage. 
and they fly these drones and knock each other out. So I figured that's cool. Uh, so right away I go to Phil's department and talk to Julie, can FCSS, because kids love so uh, baseball, football, soccer, all that. There's some kids that maybe like this, the coding, hooking up with schools. So we had a meeting just the other day with uh, Julie and we're putting down prerequisite Mark's company, uh, Project Safe is the name of his company, that they'll provide support. We train trainers and get kids involved. And hopefully there's a group in town that for FCSS will just, hey, we're there to support you and take this off. But this call, this leads to building a labor pool. And that's how it is. So you start with the kids, make it fun, hopefully this works out. And the thing that I love, this is a pilot project, and I says, Mark, before you go to other communities, I wanna be the first. Because when we get to the vision statement of innovation in Vegreville, it started in Vegreville. Press, innovation, it all ties uh, together there. So I thought that was cool. Uh, other areas, distribution and warehousing. Uh, again, 30 minutes before I walked into this presentation, a report was released about absorption of industrial space in Edmonton. It looks like the warehousing and distribution centers, another company just opened up uh, three sites in Canada. One is the Edmonton International. Regarding the supply chains, they're looking at warehousing and distribution. Can Vegreville be a piece of that action? Because again, just in time, storage, if you wanna store all your Christmas gifts, do it in Vegreville at a great warehouse, the whole bit. So that's an angle there. Leduc Niscu, Sherwood Park landlords benefited from factors mentioned above. Demand for large fabrication facilities and warehouse space is solid. And of course, this is a double-edged sword, the price of oil might hit $100 a barrel by winter and the costs are gonna go up but there is some activity. The office space, leasing, the numbers are still low. In that Edmonton area, they're five to seven dollars a square foot uh, there. So something to keep in mind. Oil and gas manufacturing as well. The other thing I wanted to highlight, I also work very closely with the CHTA, the Canadian Hemp Trade Alliance. Great contacts there, Invest Alberta, Alberta Ag. I also wanna give a shout out to MLA Jackie Hominyuk, who has been very gracious with her time and support, whether it's Bueller, as well as information on leads that Vegreville has a chance. Uh, and I'm looking forward to talk to Shannon soon. I miss her. So uh, I wanted to give kudos to, uh, to Jackie there. Next slide. Basically, as, you've, as the mayor and council wants, increase the awareness of Vegreville to invest, work and live, enhance Vegreville's brand, of course, we all realize the iconic Pesinka brings people to town. It's very important that we leverage that and give them a reason to stay. Because I looked at the numbers from visitors, yeah, people are coming to our town. And hopefully working with Phil's department and tourism, get a lot of this information, add our tourist information, a lot of this marketing material at the warehouse, leverage internally. Scott even highlighted it, cross promotion. Where do people go to the information? Bottom line, yes, we want to increase the tax base, focus on business and industry, and of course the number of investors uh, aware of opportunities. So that about wraps up my report. To end off, what the council's about to see is a 60 second video, a virtual video that I put together. This was part of Alberta Hub's uh, funding that we got drone footage and made a video. The first video you're going to see is one in a series. Uh, I also want to thank Jameson because the videos, the cool videos that he's got on our social media, flying that drone in the pool, and he's got some other great shots, as well as I want to acknowledge Michelle Henderson from the chamber. She looked after the, the uh, retail end of it. And then of course I focused on the economic development part. Uh, this first video focuses on transportation logistics, Prosperity and 75th Street, but at a basic level. The next one we're going to do is more focus using augmented reality, envision what happens to expand at these parks and areas like that. So I'm gonna walk away from the podium and Jameson, if you wanna give that a shot and see what happens. Oh, you can get started yet? Good. Just please keep in mind that this video was made to watch of a computer not on a big screen. So some of the text you might not see, but I'm hoping the council and mayor 
you get a good feel for it. It'll be fine, Bob. Well, James is trying to cue that up. I've seen you make many presentations over the years. I've never seen you ever stand still before. I, that is <laughs> you. I told that to Jameson. I'm very animated. Yeah, you usually would make three laps around the room. <laughs> now you know why I'm so short. This is streaming live. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you for noticing that, because I know you know I, I'm not one to... Uh, well, whatever to you're comfortable with. Well, we certainly can. Um, I think that uh, I'll just start, uh, and uh, I know that council has been wondering what Bob's been up to since he's been here, and uh, I know that Bob and me have been having weekly meetings, basically <laughs> impromptu meetings, and uh, COVID has been a pain in the butt, but I honestly believe that it's helped you in this job. It's given you some time to review all of these reports that are on the shelves all over that we've had done, um, you know, I, uh, you're trying to find out what you have in your toolbox here, and, and, and I appreciate that, and, uh, and, and it's been working for you, and I know the conversations we've had, and you're trying to figure out how this town works, and, and what buildings are what, and who <laughs> belongs to who, and how did this get built, and what used to be there, and, yeah. and, and, I, and I enjoy filling you in, and, and we're going to keep doing that. Yeah. But uh, I wanted to let you know that uh, I liked our meetings, and uh, and I think that we're going to about uh, to make things roll here a little bit right now. So, well, we're definitely going to give it, uh, you know, our, our best try. And uh, is it easy in this environment? No. However, the virtual world has also allowed me to connect with people that no, I normally couldn't. Uh, you know, to have a discussion with somebody from BC or from somebody from Toronto, and there's no cost related. And most of the businesses today understand that, and it's bang, bang, bang. We stick to business and, and that like that. Again, it's, it is a whole new world, and change is the only constant, you know, in how business is, because it's going to be interesting what Vigorville is going to look like in the year 2030, which is only eight years away, you know, and uh, it's... Uh, it's freaky. Uh, again, I can't thank, uh, again, Dale's department uh, with Karina and his team there. They're sharing information. Uh, she was talking with our new property owners from the mall, uh, and she mentioned hemp, and one of his partners is involved in the hemp industry, and he showed up at the hemp day. So again, the networking, and that's what I look at the council, the mayor and council, the people that you know, the information, you know, uh, part of that investment uh, brochure folder that I put together, I noticed a lot of elected officials when speaking to their MLAs or their MPs verbally, but what can I hand them that they remember because our MLAs and MPs and ministers are trying to remember a lot of information. What stands out? Because yes, I am looking for the story of Eggerville. I get the Pesinka, but what is the story of Eggerville? And it's the people. And uh, that, that is what's so critical, so. So, I uh, imagine there's a few questions that uh, people would uh, like to ask Bob. I would just like to uh, touch on one thing that Bob does, and I've seen him do it many times in different departments, is when they're talking to other people, the citizens of Vegreville, different departments, Bob will come right up and, and ask them, you know, like, well, that information would be important. No matter what department you're in, we're all in economic development. Everybody that works in this organization. And uh, I, I, I see the benefits that you're, that are all across this organization, people are starting to pick up on that. Yeah. So I just wanted to thank you for that, Bob. So who wanted to go first questions? Okay, we'll start with uh, Councillor Warwick. Well, I just first wanted to say that I really appreciate your energy and your excitement, and it makes me excited to see where we can go. So I feel that. I've obviously just looked at this for two minutes, but it looks professional, and it looks like something that I don't feel like we've necessarily had previous, so I'm excited about that. Um, 
I really just wanted to highlight that I think that any approach that is innovation but also can tie in the youth factor um, somewhat on the virtual side, the IT side, when you mentioned that, that's really important to me. I've been hearing that lots. Um, we find that youth seem to fall into a category where there's a category of youth that feel like there isn't much for them. They maybe don't fall into some of the current existing opportunities, some of the sporting opportunities, and they've got this really cool uh, skill set on the IT side that I quite frankly can't even understand because <laughs> I can barely get my computer to turn on. Um, but I anything we can tie that in, I think, is really gonna is gonna be a selling feature because I think when people look where to move and and want to live, they look at recreation on one side. But recreation can be sports, but recreation is also what else can you do with your time with your youth. So I think that's really super exciting. The one question I did have, um, obviously when we're dealing with our businesses, we're looking at enticing new businesses and also um, looking after and working with and supporting our existing businesses. And you mentioned um, the labor force, uh, of course, being an issue, being able to find members. We're, this is more out of a curiosity. When you spoke with existing businesses um, and they talked about inability to get uh, laborers, did they indicate to you at all whether they have only looked within town, whether they've taken steps outside of the community, or whether they're what they're asking of us, whether they're asking for you know uh, some direction as to how to do that or wanting us to do that? I'm just kind of wondering what their take was when they're talking about labor shortage. Uh, well, just this morning, or this afternoon, speaking with Tammy, she had to lay off uh, a couple of ladies, and I asked, where did they live? In Beggarville. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, is it the CERB support that is causing people to wait? Uh, it's coming to an end, and she's starting to get calls back there. So what the factors are, right now, 42% of the labor, the working day, the population of Vegreville grows to just over 1,000. 42% come from uh, Minburn County. 15% come from Edmonton. Uh, then we have Willingdon, two hills that make up the rest. So, yeah, people will drive in. Uh, it's a labor issue. If there's a, is there anything the councillor we can do? Not necessarily. It's just a matter of, yeah, finding that labor and the why. There is a labor shortage when you see an unemployment rate of 15%. What is it? What's keeping people from working? I, I don't I don't have that answer. But it's, it's not just the, uh, the, the town of Vegreville. No. And it's not just the province of Alberta. Yep. It seems to be a phenomenal Nationwide. that's going right across this country. Yep. That's very... And unemployment is right at 15%. Yep. Doesn't... I think he hit the point to to see what happens shortly after the end of, supp of these supplement programs because right now it is very difficult when we will hear numbers, but then we also do have heard from some employers that have genuinely not been able to get laborers. So I guess yep. some of it may be a little bit of a wait and see project. So yep. okay, thank you, Bob. Oh, we think we're ready for the presentation. I'd so like we'll to put the other 22 questions on hold. I'm sorry uh, for the technical glitch. Uh, Sandra had to go and run and grab her uh, computer because Bob's video is so mind blowing that it froze my computer. So uh, I apologize to Bob and to council for the technical difficulties, but I think we are indeed ready to go. It's a good start. Mm -hmm. And again, like Bob says, that augmented reality when you can pop buildings in anywhere you want and have the drone flying in between buildings that aren't even there. It's usually, it's a visual is a huge thing. Yeah. 
That's the uh, going rate. It, it is a lot of work. I'd like to say I directed it, like I have to go through five clips, and you know, when you're cutting in, it is some work, but this is what it is, and it, it's, it's attaching emotion. Like when you saw that folder, okay, it's got a pop, it's got a wow. The music will add that excitement and it gives that feeling. So again, as Jameson knows when it comes to marketing, evoking all the senses and business decisions. Okay, Bob, you got my attention. Now back it up with facts. And that's where that data that you have there. And does it make a business sense? Like the site selection criteria this lady sent me regarding the hemptocorticator. There it is. Okay, your utilities, quantity of gas, land zone, feed supply in there. So focusing on that and adding to the brand of Vagerville. And you're right, because what can I send you? Bob, send me something. The stick aspect, like I gave you uh, the folder. But again, Bob, save a tree. Give me all the data on the stick. Here you go. So the information A, and then the vehicle to do that. Councilor Riddick, would you have a question of uh, our economic development uh, manager? Sure. I am very happy to see this package in every sense. I think we've worked really hard over the term of this council, but even before this, to get to this point. So the accumulation of knowledge and experience and preparedness has led us to this point where we can actually give the data that was collected, collated, and relevant to our community and provide it to, um, to those that might be interested. And I think we're, we still have other things that we can do and um, that we can improve upon, but we're at the right spot now. And I think even the conversation when this council was first elected, we talked about making sure that every person from utility clerk right up to um, economic development manager and council understand that we're all part of increasing the wealth in the community by um, amplifying the effect of current and future businesses. So I'm very excited. This, the MDB report, for those of you that may not remember, the, the CARES grant was given to MDB to provide the data and get all of this information. So this is exciting. If you were gonna give your top three things that need to happen in the next six months, because there's a lot of stuff on play, and there's lots that you've shared here, and I have the good fortune of being able to have other conversations with you with our board at Economic Development. Um, but there are a lot of things that are happening, and things that I think people don't understand is that businesses make their own decisions, and we just need to be ready. Yeah. So that video showing um, a visual story, but also having this information that they need, what would you see as the top three things that um, Beggarville needs to have? be prepared for in the next six months, whether it's us facilitating as council and admin, or it's you. I don't know if I could give top three, and uh, thank you for uh, acknowledging that. And again, it, it goes back to marketing and telling our story. It's, it's, my focus is being proactive, getting the right information to the right people at the right time. Uh, there's a list of uh, investors that MDB uh, and the former economic development created. It's just getting our message out. And, and again, to investors, local, regional, national. It's getting that, for lack of a better term, with all due respect, a target list and doing the homework and saying, okay, what companies, which companies are looking? Like I say, identifying warehousing and distribution companies. Are they aware of Vegreville? How do we fit in? Uh, Again, it's being proactive. Collecting the information is one thing, but getting it out. Uh, a lot of things work in parallel. It's very difficult to focus on one thing without, you know, everything else. So I guess I can sum it up of being proactive in these types of areas of getting this out. That would be where I'm focused on. A follow-up question? Through the chair to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have a follow-up question. So... Uh, we have um, some labor needs that are going to be more apparent as we move forward. And just on a, another venture that we were doing with health professionals, attraction retention, just at a cursory inventory, we have 480 individuals in the community that provide health services from physicians down to healthcare aides, which is a significant amount. Are you, uh, I guess we can't know for sure, but how much of the data that you've got in here comes from the census? that was completed right now, and when will you have it to be able to uh, address what our labor needs are moving forward? Uh, the census, the first census, come, the results of the census later this year, beginning of the new year, will be the ag census. 
Uh, I'm still getting a schedule. Uh, and I, if I'm not mistaken, you probably supplied me that schedule way <laughs> back when. Uh, yeah, they're going to release over the next 12 to 18 months, you know, this data. What the numbers will show, it'll be interesting with COVID, how many, you know, did our population take us over to 6,000 kids coming back home? There's going to be a lot of data to decipher. Uh, Cliff even asked me that when he saw these uh, investment. Like, yeah, I'm still quoting data from 2016. Well, every five years, federal census. So the ag data, that's why I'm holding off on the ag profile to get that data. And this goes back to Cliff and I have had conversations, clerical support, because the mayor and council or Cliff didn't put me in my position to sit behind a desk and do, even though I love doing it, no problem. But this is an area we're looking to update it. We also subscribe to local Intel. Uh, this has been a good program for Vegreville in the past. They supply a lot of the data that we can cut and paste the graphs and use that information in our profile there. Because again, the website is passive, where this is proactive and sending it out. So it's gonna, that information is gonna trickle through here over the last next, like I say, 12 months, ag first, window release, repopulation, labor, demographics, probably not till mid 2022 <laughs> on that. And that's gonna be an interesting story for council to look at. You know, your population, our population can go up to 6,500. I don't know, it, it'll be interesting. Okay, anybody else have any questions? Councillor Barry. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm certainly pleased that you don't stand still. <laughs> I, think that, I think that the enthusiasm shows through. I think the report looks really good. And um, yeah, I, I also believe that every, everybody in town is an ambassador for the community. And I think that uh, the more we can get people to come here and see what we're doing and appreciate what is going on, uh, the word is spreading. And I also like the, your comment about tourism and because I've always believed that uh, bringing a dollar into town creates community wealth. So I think those, those outside dollars, the more we can attract them here, um, the, the better that we grow. So I, I'm looking forward to this report and I'm really glad to see that it's here. Thank you. And you're right that for every dollar spent, tourism is multiplied minimum by seven, eight times uh, on that. So thank you. Well, okay then. Well, um, I just want to put in my two bits here too then. I know that uh, a lot of uh, industry is driven by site selectors and stuff today, but we still have to put that personal touch on. Yep. When somebody we know somebody's identified us as a, a possibility, and, and I know we've talked about it many times, and we're not afraid to reach out to anybody and talk to anybody, and we don't need to ever take no for an answer, and that's our, our philosophy here. So. <laughs> and again, just, you know, we change the way we do things, the way we look at ourselves as a community. I know that we're changing this organization, that everybody's in on economic development within this organization. We get our community on board with that. We'll be the biggest ambassadors ourselves. So mm -hmm. thank you, Bob, and uh, I'm glad for your presentation. And uh, we will be uh, looking for more of these in the next little while, and I'll probably talk to you on Wednesday of next week. Oh, we'll be talking sooner, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay. And just before I leave, I do want to acknowledge and thank Cliff Craig. Uh, Cliff's leadership style, uh, his door has always been open, uh, and you always have time. And I just want to publicly acknowledge Cliff. Thank you for that. That meant the world to me uh, for that ability that any question I had at any time, uh, your door is always open. So thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. So I take it the original delegation is definitely off the agenda for, for moving forward. Uh, we received notification the uh, delegation is in the Yukon. The Yukon? He, he will not be attending today's meeting. Okay. Okay, so our next meeting is next Tuesday in the Yukon. <laughs> Just joking. Okay. Road trip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got a motorhome. Okay, so well, I guess we'll move to the next piece, which will be uh, Paul Casey. Thank you, Your Worship. The first thing on uh, my list of things is the 2020 financial audit municipal indicators that are issued by Municipal Affairs based on our uh, 2020 audited financial statements. Um, so I'll go through each one of them and kind of give you what they mean and whether they're good or bad. So. Obviously the first one, the audit outcome was no concern, which is great. It means that the auditors had no uh, 
uh, areas of concern and did not qualify our report and gave us a clean audit opinion. Uh, the second one is also great, ministry intervention. So obviously the minister didn't have to get involved in anything in the town, so that was great. Uh, the tax base balance of 50.19%, that represents the number of dollars of residential tax collected out of our total tax base. So while we have a different factor when we're calculating our, our, our levy, typically what happens after our levy is issued, we get adjustments from the assessor for, that are called 3051 adjustments. And last year, after we had issued our levy, we had significant adjustments for several of the hotels in town. So that reduced the amount of commercial tax that we received. Um, our tax collection rate uh, is in the red, 87.03%. The trigger for municipal affairs is 90%. Um, so what that means is we didn't collect 90% of our taxes, and I would like to blame that on municipal affairs because if they would have paid us, in December instead of January, we would have been out 95%. So, so could, could you update us, Paul, realistically, where are we at in our tax collection rate? Right now, as provinces? of as of today, we're at 85.2% of our taxes collected. We have about $750,000 to collect under the uh, monthly payment plans. So for the next three months, about 250000 a month. And the province owes us still $998,000. So we will be, even if we collect that $750,000, don't collect the province's money, we will be over the 90% number. So it's kind of funny that they put us in red, even though yeah. <laughs> they're the reason. And I'm sure there's probably other communities in yeah. the province that have the same red figure. Okay. Uh, population change is a change, a 10 year change. So it's based on what your population was 10 years ago to today, and it's gone down 2.16%. Uh, the current ratio of 3.04 means that we have $3.04 of current assets, so cash and accounts receivable, uh, to pay our current liabilities, so our accounts payable and our current portion of our long-term debt. The accumulated surplus of $8.9 million is our unrestricted surplus plus our committed reserves that we set up. Um, the trigger for municipal affairs is $1. If we're over, if we're not at zero, if we're at $1, we pass. If we're at zero or below, we fail. So we're a long way from failing on that count. On-time financial reporting is uh, that we delivered our financial information to the province by May the 1st, which we did. We delivered it in April. Uh, the debt to revenue percentage, and excuse me, I'm just going to go to something else here. Just let me find it. I know what it is, but I don't want to. Okay. So the debt to revenue percentage is the total amount of borrowings, including long-term capital leases as a percentage of total municipal revenues. So the expected result for municipal affairs is that the municipality's total borrowings represent less than 120% of uh, its debt as total revenue. So we're at 69%, so we're well within the limit. The debt to service ratio percentage is the total cost of making scheduled repayments, including interest on borrowings as a percentage of total revenues. We're at 5.65% and the guideline that municipal affairs goes by is 20%. So we're well within the target for that. Investment in infrastructure <coughs> means that we invested $1.32 more in infrastructure than we depreciated the infrastructure during the year. Uh, and that's a positive sign. It means that we are renewing our infrastructure assets. Unfortunately, the next one, the infrastructure age of 36.16%, indicates uh, that our infrastructure is either aging and not being replaced as quickly as we'd like over time. I mean, over the last few years it has been, but we, I think last year we were at about 35%, so we're at 36% this year, so it's better. But it also could mean that we have written off our assets, or depreciated our assets faster than maybe we could have. We could, maybe could have stretched it a little bit longer because what happens when you uh, 
uh, depreciate your assets down to zero, this, this calculation is the net book value divided by the total cost. So your net book value is zero, but your total cost is still on the books. Mm -hmm. So that would mean if you only had one asset for a million dollars and you depreciated to zero, this ratio would be zero. So what that's some the, things that we have to look at. What would be the benefit of us uh, depreciating uh, our assets faster? Like why, why were we doing that? Like what do you think? I don't know if we are doing that oh. uh, in relation to anybody else. Um, I just know that in our TCA policy that the rate, the rate of depreciation has been set. And I've looked at other uh, uh, TCA policies for other municipalities and the ones I've looked at seem to be similar to us. So it may, have, may be that we have assets that we brought onto the books when TCA came in that were already completely amortized. Okay. So I know Megan is going to look into that for us. Um, and then the other one, interest in municipal office for 2020 was not uh, relevant because there was no election, but it's basically do you have enough councillors signed up to run for council? So okay. that's our report. Anybody have any questions? Well, we'll start here with uh, Councillor Rudick. So I'm just curious, this municipal indicator is part of the viability that the province uses to predetermine if there is an issue with municipality. So this is one of the things that they utilize. This is one of the things that they utilize and actually they, uh, they issue an annual report with these indicators in it and identify the municipalities that fail and need to have some intervention. So, so, so we have, we're not on that report. No, and I, I, I think that's important for citizens to, to realize that um, this is a good review, but important to understand what the numbers indicate. I, I'm curious to maybe push back a little bit to the province, particularly since the evaluation here, there are only two indications that are in the red, potentially, that are indicated, uh, and one of them is because of them. So it seems very counterintuitive that we would receive um, a flag, a potential issue, and it's directly as a result of the province. So the province is evaluating us negatively for something that they've created. So I, I will definitely be mentioning that to any of my colleagues, but I wonder if maybe we should also be pushing that back up. Um, now timing is a little bit tricky, but maybe as a, an administrative conversation, if you're having a conversation with other CAOs and CFOs and all of those good people, this seems highly problematic that the province is creating a problem for municipalities. But I appreciate you bringing this forward to us. I don't know that we've ever received it in this format. I'll, I'll read you what that actually, what the province has here. The tax, the, the tax collection rate is the ability of the municipality to collect own sourced revenues, including property taxes, special taxes, local tax, local improvement taxes, well drilling equipment taxes and grants in place of taxes. So they don't pay their grants in place of taxes. It has a significant impact on us for sure. Thank you for this information and I'm sure we'll all carry that ball to the province again when we have an opportunity. Well, I know that uh, Council Rudick and myself attended the AUMA uh, conference in the summer here and I brought this question up of other municipalities where they see in the same thing that the province was lagging behind with their their shares and and everybody was nobody seen a, as a problem nobody said that they identified that within their municipality and there was quite a few mayors and councillors there uh, oh, I, go ahead, Chris. it would also depend on what each municipality has for mm. grant in place of taxes. We have a fairly large or very large facility in town that generates um, a significant amount for our grant in place of taxes. Whereas other municipalities may have either very little or none at all. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, true. So there's not, yeah, trying to discuss it with other municipalities and I did bring it up at that meeting and some were like, what does that mean? Well, I guess they don't have a lot of provincial buildings uh, the, the start is so but we will get our money I'll make sure of it I'll give uh, Minister McIver a call and we get done here and see where the check is <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Warwick 
Uh, okay, I just have two questions. One was the with our little red number there with the province, but it was just slightly different. When we said that um, the trigger was 90%, do you know is that 90% um, just a number that they've set as a trigger, or did they? Is it based upon like um, an average for provincial collection? That is a number that they have set as a okay. trigger. Okay, I thought so because it seemed like a very high number uh, for it to have been an average, right? Uh, and the second question I had was um, just on our infrastructure age. When they look at infrastructure age, um, is it simply replacement that would bring down the age or will they take upgrade into consideration to reduce the age? I was just wondering if that's a thing. Well, the calculation is, like I said, the net book value of the asset divided by the total cost of the assets. Okay. So if we do upgrades or put in new infrastructure to replace old infrastructure, then we're going to write off the old infrastructure, put in the new infrastructure, so our cost is going to go up, but so is our net book value. Okay. So we're going to get rid of the old infrastructure off the book, so our ratio should improve as we replace our infrastructure. That's really good, because I know sometimes there's always that whole debate um, as to at what point do you uh, look at full replacement versus how far do you go on um, upgrade and renovation. So, okay, thank you. Yeah. And, and the reason I brought up that it may be an issue in terms of how quickly we're, even though I haven't been able to find any evidence of that, that but or that we brought assets on that were fully written or amortized already, and I don't know that for sure, but when you look at the statistics for the province, they run about 60% is their number, and we're at 36%. So... Yeah, it, it's okay. We're, we're originally it wasn't even that that many years ago that we put this in place for the net book value of our infrastructure, and then how did we show the you know depreciation on that as we move forward? I mean, we don't make our decisions based on our infrastructure needs on this at, at all. Yeah. We we look at our needs and the age uh, of the infrastructure and where it's at, and that's what we decide on. So. Again, I mean, once Megan takes a, a good look in, in, into this and see is maybe that's the point, that we may be depreciating faster than what we need to, our, our infrastructure, our existing infrastructure, or we already depreciated it, and we may have to look at the, how we do that moving forward if we want to get out of this. What, what's the accept, uh, acceptable number here? Forty uh, percent. Forty. So we're very close there now. Yeah. So. Okay. Anybody? Uh, Councillor Lamp? Yes, thanks, Paul, for this um uh, and sharing it with us. Just uh, for information purposes, Municipal Affairs gathers this data from what sources of uh, information? Something we provide uh, to them through our financial statements or uh, where do they gather it? And is there an extensive report that we have to fill out, you have to fill out, to give them information to extrapolate the data to put it in this space? Uh, as part of our annual audit, we fill out a financial information mm -hmm. return for the province, and all municipalities do that, and that's where they collect their data from. And it has information, it has all the information that we have in our financial statements that we issue to the public, but in a different format. And so they just take it and they put it in a database, and I actually have access, we, ought, we have access to every single municipality's financial information on that database, so... So last year, after budget, you showed us an indicator from municipal affairs, uh, basically where your regular fit with res and non-res taxes on a, on a scale. When will we be available to see that again, do you think? That will be in the budget meeting in oh. November. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Next up is uh, the budgeting schedule. Yeah. So this is the budget meeting schedule for council. As a result of the election, we decided to hold off the first meeting uh, with council until the new council was in place. Um, and so some of the meetings are going to be full day or close to full day meetings. Uh, the first one on November 4th, uh, we anticipate uh, a lot of discussion in the operating and capital side. Uh, we will potentially have some, we'll be in a not bad place without this information from council as to where on our budget because we are working on our budget now and getting information in. So um, we had a budget meeting yesterday with our senior leadership group and talked about some capital stuff and uh, just in terms of the budget to, you know, keep things at a steady state as opposed to trying to budget for more than 
than we budgeted last year, if at all possible. So, unless you got some new source of income, <laughs> hey. <laughs> well, I, and I appreciate getting this scheduled early, and uh, and I think we can all attest to the fact that you're as an incoming councillor, your very first duty is to set a budget and not knowing what uh, what the half the terms mean and and what the outcomes are, and uh, you know. So uh, we'll just have to, every four years, the municipality has to go through this as a bit of a learning curve, and uh, and hopefully we're going to have uh, some excellent ambassadors still on council here that are going to help their their new uh, the new uh, councillors out. So go ahead, Councillor Warwick. I, I just want to say on our budgeting, um, I think we should, it's very important for our residents to know um, what a good system I believe we actually really do have here in Vegreville. Um, when the change came over from the province and kind of changed our timelines a bit for budgeting, it threw things a little bit in a, <laughs> a little bit crazy where everybody was trying to get it done and, and it changed the timelines on the budgets. I have spoken with many other municipalities and the reality is some of them follow regulations by just passing a budget that then they readjust and change and it's not a true budget the way ours has been. Um, I just think that it needs to be noted that we have a very good system, so thank you on that. Um, it's uh, The conversation I had was actually very eye-opening because I kind of assumed we were all doing the same process and when I had discussions with them where they basically said, we just pass it because it has to, it's basically tentative and the whole thing gets reworked months down the road as well. Um, the fact that we're set up as we are is great and it will be great for any new council as well because uh, it's way ahead of the game of where they could be. So I just thought we should note that. Okay, any other questions regarding the budget schedule? Okay, we'll move on there then, Paul. Sorry. Oh, sorry, uh, I didn't see you. You just right beside me, I did not see you. I could be louder. Oh. Um, if there are potential, uh, any conflicts, I'm assuming you, you would like those as soon as possible because there's Absolutely. a lot of moving parts. Yep. Okay. okay, I guess that's it on that matter. We'll move to the, the Royal Legion. Uh, yes, Your Worship, this is a letter we received from the Royal Canadian Legion. Um, it says, Dear Mayor and Council, the Vegreville branch of the Royal Canadian Legion is working with the Last Post Fund in an attempt to locate, identify, and upgrade unmarked veterans' graves in the Vegreville area. An unmarked grave would be described as a grave with no marker or no permanent marker, for example, a wooden marker. The last post is supported by Veterans Affairs Canada to provide funeral or memorial services to indigent, indigent veterans and to provide a permanent headstone to recognize the service and sacrifices of these brave Canadians. It is likely that there are eligible veterans in this area are lying in unmarked graves either as a result of the economy at the time of their passing or because they and their families were not aware of available programs. We respectfully, respectfully ask your cooperation in providing any information you have regarding unmarked graves of veterans in cemeteries that are under your control in the community that you represent. If you are aware of any cemetery associations or societies that are mandated to have authority for individual cemeteries, would you please share this information? Information can be sent to the letterhead address to the attention of Rhonda Haydick, service officer, or email to our or by email. Thank you in advance for any information that you're able to provide. Rhonda Haydick, Service Officer, Vegreville Branch, Royal Canadian Legion. And uh, with that, they had sent a brochure and we have given it to our cemetery clerk to start looking to see if we have any unmarked uh, veterans' graves here that might qualify for some funding under this. How is uh, the transfer from the old book to the new... Uh digitalized uh, type of uh, court accounting. Uh, I think cemetery. I'll pass that over to Megan to talk about, so. Can I talk for a bit? Yep, you can talk. Or you uh, want whatever, or talk loud. So it's actually... Take your time. Hello, everyone. So actually this project is going fairly well. We have a fairly stringent deadline of October 15th to do some catch up on additional items. We had the new columbarium added in, I believe it was 2020. And so we had to get it added back into our cemetery program. So there's been a little bit of catch up, um, reworking and getting them into the formal system, but we're raging ahead and hopefully it'll be all caught up very shortly. 
And as far as uh, the ask of the Legion here, do you think that we'll be able to provide them the information in a timely manner? I believe so, yeah. The um, cemetery clerk is quite knowledgeable. Um, some of these graves might be very, very from several, several years past. So we do have a little bit of groundwork to do on that, but we will try and do some searches and have information shortly. Okay. Anybody else have a question for Megan? Go ahead, mm -hmm. Councillor Reed. So the October 15th deadline, is that something that you've impl implemented internally or is that to meet the deadline for the Legion? Because I, I, I wonder if there's some timeliness from their part or if it's just a, an open-ended, it doesn't seem to suggest here. I don't believe that there is a deadline f through the Legion, but that was my internal deadline that I gave for our members that were working on it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So hopefully we can get, the, especially if there is any uh, unmarked graves out there, it would be nice to get them identified and uh, dealt with in, uh, in a very respectful manner. And I know that the Legion will always make sure that they do the right thing. So thank you very much. Before we start in the next, does anybody need a break? Okay, we will take a five-minute break then. Thank you.